Welcome back. Yes, indeed. Now we turn our attention to economic matters as it affects all of us. And so as you've seen there, we've got uh, Dr. Kalu Dekakalu, who is the former Minister of Finance. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, thank you for allowing us waking up very early this morning on the program. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you. Okay, so... Talking about the economy, uh, there are different things going on, different policies, but uh, at least one of the most recent statements is uh, where the president says he deserves to have, or to be in the Guinness World Record for his economic policies. And so uh, that suggests that uh, the policies are having at least an appreciable impact on the people. So, uh, yes, in his inaugural speech as well, he did make reference to how he intends to govern, his style. But I think one of the things that stuck out on that day was the fuel subsidy. So it caught fire from then on. We had the impact on the petrol price and the rest, they say, is history. So let me ask you directly, concerning the removal of fuel subsidy, I know you also spoke about it several times in terms of the way a manner it ought to have been done. So, considering the impacts that is having or having been done, what do you think of what has been done with the petrol subsidy by this government? Well, once we took that decision to remove subsidies uh, in one fair soup, uh, it was pretty easy to predict the consequences on the economy. Now, if there is one word that explains all this, is the whole notion of a lag. See, in the economy, even if you are distributing goods that have already been produced, it takes time to distribute. How much more will you have to now plan under different uh, price, interest rate, exchange regimes, financial regimes, uh, to, to decide what to produce. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned some of the comments I've made before. It was essentially uh, focusing on the necessity to, to take a decision that takes a full account of the very lags in the system. Lag in uh, production, lag in distribution, lag in production, and so on and so forth. Uh, the reason for that, of course, is that things don't happen quite that instantaneously, regardless of your eagerness to, uh, to execute what you might call a political will to take a decision. You have to still take into account how the system, as it were, will absorb it so that there will be some sort of a, a seamless impact on the consumers, the producers, the importers, the exporters, and all uh, agents in the system. So this was the thing. But uh, one of the earlier statements I had made was that I was impressed that having made that statement, efforts were being quickly put in place uh, to see how we can now douse it. Well, of course, this efforts too also require a lag to mobilize resources, to channel the resources, and so on and so forth. So this is where it's at. Yes. Okay, and so then going back to the issue that you raised. Right. Go ahead. You raised about uh, being, being put in the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, maybe the president is right. I, I don't think we quite got the extent of his thinking. Uh, if you look at Nigeria with the sheer size of our economy, the share size of our population, the resources we have, we really deserve a Guinness Book of Records. How we managed to have our exchange rate depreciate from about one to one in the 80s to over a thousand. That, that, that requires a Guinness Book of uh, Records. Uh, but I'm not sure that is the way he meant it. Uh, I don't think we can award ourselves a Guinness Book for, for efficiency in the uh, evolution of policies, and even worse in their implementation. So I think it depends on where you see it. The important thing is that all of us can own to the real situation we are facing. Whichever uh, aspect of the poli politics you are, you are on, whether you are in the far opposition, near opposition, 
or within the government system. This is the time the Nigerians as a whole, consumers, producers, industrialists, financiers, all the youth uh, eagerness to get involved and be taken on board. This is the time we begin to speak the truth to ourselves. That is all I have said, and that's what I will I will try to do in the course of this uh, program. Okay, so uh, Doctor, in, in another breath, we also heard the president say that the the essence, the purpose for the removal of petrol subsidy had been achieved. But we then go out there and see the spiral effect that the subsidy removal is having on inflation, goods and services, and generally across board. And yes, they spoke about palliatives and what needs to be done. So from your professional perspective, do you see the whole scheme? Do you see that there's a plan in place with the way and manner that we're going about it? Well, um, one cannot overemphasize the fact that there is nothing inherently negative about the use of subsidies. If you took a poll around Africa, Europe, America, everywhere, uh, uh, governments, entities employ subsidies as a way to achieve positive encouragement for producers or distributors or transporters, what have you. So we can only judge the success of the removal of subsidy by the uh, effect it has on the objectives we had in mind. Clearly, for sustaining subsidies for such a long period, normally you should, sub you should manage subsidies so you are still within the, the price range that is dictated by the market. If you go out of the market in terms of the, the cost of of funds in terms of interest rates or, or exchange rate management in, in, in the terms of the share spread that was really abnormal by any world standard. It was abnormal, the share spread of how we are locating foreign exchange at different prices. And that was why there was all this emphasis on uh, unifying the rate. Unifying the rate so that the saver, the person who is saving foreign exchange, which means saving in Naira or whatever currency, you can translate that currency to any currency, any service into whatever currency you want. So these are, these are the issues. So uh, it may be too early to write it off as, as not having achieved this purpose, depending on how quickly we can mobilize to produce more in order to moderate prices. Uh, if you look at our inflationary uh, uh, pressures, we, we see that uh, food prices, for instance, have probably risen faster. Just as I said, the only way you can modulate that is if you are able to produce fast, but that is delimited by the factors of production and weather and technology and distribution and so on and so forth. Or you can bridge the gap uh, that is occasioned by the sharp rise in food prices by importation. There's a lag in importation, depending on where that import will be coming from. So, once again, uh, we have to be very careful uh, in defending ourselves to be too premature in coming to conclusions as to whether we have succeeded in our objective. Everything takes time. Uh, there's no better way to explain this thing than the adage that everything takes time. Even if you are taking what is already in your plate, it takes time for you to even eat it. That is like the minutest come of lag. Not to talk of where you have to decide on what to plant, how to prepare the soil, and the time to, to, to tend to the seeds, harvest it. That one, you, there's very little you can do, despite all the advances in agricultural science. There are, there are set periods for or lags in, whether it's a primary production mining or agricultural production or in manufacturing or even in delivering infrastructures. We know that, we know how, lucky, how long it takes to patch our roads and our, our bridges. And while they are being done, there's not, not much you can do but wait for this to be completed in order to improve the efficiency of the system. All right, we, we need to just take a breather, but just give us a moment. We'll be back to take on more issues on this matter. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We are with Dr. Carlo Idega Carlo, who is Nigeria's former Minister of Finance. One of the policies or announcements that the government has made to cushion the effects or the impact of the subsidy on the people is that they plan to have some of the refineries working at the end of the year. And then they've talked about rolling out CNG buses to cushion the impact of transportation costs on the populace as well. So about this petrol, having refineries work, which they say will reduce the burden, the pressure on, on Forex. What kind of impact do you see having the refineries or at least a few of them working? What impact will it have on first the purchasing power and probably largely on the foreign exchange? Well, first of all, I think the uh, constant reporter has said before, where what you're dealing with is different lags in response. Uh -huh. Just like we are talking about what we needed to do about the refineries. Some of the actions will, be, will have immediate effect. Like we, most people think that's a sizable element of a fraud in the operation of the system. That one you don't need to have any, any thoughts about just stopping immediately whether fraudulent uh, reports, uh, fraudulent, fraudulent recordings of uh, supplies from local or external sources, those can go quickly. But where you are trying to ameliorate is price impact by things like setting up, reactivating the refineries, which, by the way, we should have done several years ago. So I think another thing I say in parenthesis is that we should, we should not discuss this as if all the faults are at the door of the present administration. We all know that. This has been simmering for many years. I remember a few years ago when I also objected to the, to the feeling that you can do uh, a swift removal of subsidy. I said, yeah, you, you, you can remove the subsidy, but having allowed it to fester for so long, it's only proper in economic terms, in administrative terms, to phase it over a period, quarters, budget years, or even a few years, that is how it's done everywhere. This gives the chance for those who are going to respond, whether in, in taking over the refineries, or, or, in, a, or in repairing a, a power station, or in providing a more mass transit, which, by the way, we should have done a lot more of all of these things. That's why I said I'm not quite sure uh, uh, whether why, why we'll be getting a, bit, a Guinness Book of Records. It will be for the very fact that we everybody could see that these are the things we should have done to avoid the kind of high cost of living and all the higher costs in every single subsector of the primary of primary production or or secondary production uh, manufacturing and so on and so forth. So um, yes. The, the, the suggestions uh, that was prepared was that we should build more refineries, we should build more modular refineries, we should privatize, whether it is power or refineries, precisely to those who are able to turn these things around. When you've done that, you are able to uh, project the additions to supply of power, of uh, fuel products, and so on and so forth. So you cannot take a decision swiftly as it were in the blind. Uh -huh. So having said that, my answer is, is clear that, well, it's going to take us a while to, to, uh, 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 to let the, the, the station stabilize. But let's be patient, but we have to put pressure so that all those kings, that things that come from poor administration, uh, prevalent corruption, and uh, other things that uh, create all the inefficiencies, we see in, uh, in our system. The public, the external investor we're encouraging to come in should be able to see from their own standpoint that we are making good with a lot of the decisions we are making to improve the Nigerian system. This economy should be growing at a much faster rate, certainly way beyond the increase in, uh, in uh, population growth or even the growth of the labor force. We are way beyond those the basic benchmarks for uh, assessing how efficiently we are managing the tremendous resources we have in agriculture or non-agricultural sectors. Speaking about foreign exchange, 
The CBN announced the collapse of all windows into the INE window, and they said that was to improve liquidity and also enhance stability in the market. Now, the jury is out on whether or not that is working. So, will that singular action suffice? I mean, will it have the kind of impact that it should have? Because in the meantime, I mean, we can all see that uh, at the moment, not exactly what people thought. Well, uh, you know, the way you even put the question uh, underscores some of the misunderstandings we have. We talk about singular action. There are very few singular actions in a dynamic general equilibrium system. That is the general, like you go to our markets. There's nothing uh, like a single action. If you go beyond what the general equilibrium uh, uh, adjustment, whether you see the graphs or not, that relates abundance of supply or limited supply to the quantum of demand in time frame, uh, you know that you have problems. So, so there is, there's no, it's not a question of singular thing. The basic problem with multiple rates that it underscores the share inefficiency in the distribution of scarce resources. Uh -huh. It doesn't have to be foreign exchange. It could be corn. It could be bread. It could be cassava. It could be yams or rice or whatever. If you deviate from what the demand and supply will suggest, then the pressures will come inexorably to put pressure on the system. Uh -huh. So we should not be asking the question like that, that already condemns what our policy was taking. And those policies must be fully cognizant of the depth of the problems involved, of the variety of the factors that come to play in creating more supply or in encouraging less demand through uh, all kinds of adjustments in the financial sector. So this, this, we are dealing with a lot of dynamics here. No matter the jargons the economists use, these are the things that the ordinary market women and men in various places, they understand these things. They, are, they employ this, they have a sense of it. If you have short supply, the chances are prices will go up. Uh, and the seasons allows for some of this to be modulated over the various seasons of the year, and so on and so forth. Yes. So once again, we should be cautionary in in judging the what you might call the absolute success of the policies. You have to give it time to to, to work itself out through the system. And above all, that policy makers must up in the ab initial acknowledge uh, the intrinsic. Uh, uh, existence of all the lags that impinge on increasing supply or reducing demand. Well, uh, Dr. Kalu, thank you for all of this understanding you are giving us. You know, when you were talking the other time, listening with rapt attention, I noted very, very uh, pointedly that you mentioned production, that we needed to produce more. Now, uh, looking at uh, all of the policies on ground, all of the um, business enabling or environments that we have, the policies of governments, including the drive of the federal government since he got into the, the, the president, since he got into power, to drive foreign investment into the country. Help us take a general overview of in the investment uh, climate in Nigeria and its capacity to produce long-term sustainably for the economy to be able to bear. What is your ass assessment of that? Because we hear all kinds of things from uh, the organized private sector, that it's caustic, it's not very, very investment friendly and all of those things. Now that the president is asking for more investors to, to come into the country and invest, help us take an overview of the investment climate, the challenges people may likely have and what needs to be done to ensure that all things go quite smoothly. It's not clear. We could do something about it. Can't you say we can't hear? Can, can you hear me now, sir? Well, a lot of it was very low. Okay. Uh, but I think I can have a sense of what you are trying to say. Okay. Um, primarily, the incentives that encourage Nigerians to save, Nigerians to invest, are the same thing that will encourage the foreigners 
and you can say we have to add a little bit more because they have to come from a distance. They have to uh, go over uh, tariff, non-tariff barriers, and of course exchange and ex other restrictions, which are some of the things we are trying to remove. So while you can, in a general sense, say that of course it's good to go to Moscow or to go to uh, Buenos uh, Aires or to uh, Brasilia, anywhere, and encourage investors to come. Those investors that will come clearly are those who are showing interest in your origins, in your destination, in your own market environment. So what I'm really saying is that, yes, those efforts are laudable, but they need to be built more on how we are creating the enabling environment, whether it is for the domestic investors or for the foreign investor. Uh, from issues of security to issues of uh, uh, infrastructure, power, transportation, communications, the whole uh, business where people expect to go to a country and they can stay safely in hotels, they can move about without undue uh, fears of their own personal safety. These are our own problems to fix. Well, we do not have to do it first before we start to ask for foreign investment. But we certainly have to make sure that we reach a certain threshold in the, in, in the uh, attraction that we put out for those who will be coming from beyond our borders. Yes, and I agree that lately we seem to be putting undue emphasis on how much uh, we are clinking glasses in London and Washington and Paris, but I suggest that uh, we should be as concerned with how we are facing the political issues, the constitutional issues, the economic issues, the infrastructural issues, the judiciary questions, a whole lot of questions that people see on the front pages of their newspapers or on their television. It is the uh, combination of these factors that goes far beyond the, 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 the nice language that you use in spinning the, the stories about how attractive we are, where, uh, where we have comparative advantage in as a destination for investors from abroad. Mm -hmm. So we need, we need to be doing those things simultaneously, but certainly in our own situation where uh, Nigeria was considered a very attractive destination in the 60s and 70s. We are growing fast, manufacturing was growing at over 10%, and uh, the primary sectors, even our uh, produce exports, we are growing very fast. But as the economy advances, as we are moving into more um, manufacturing and so on, we, we are getting competition from other producers within the region, within the sub-region of Africa, and certainly within the general underdeveloped countries, where people are all struggling to sell to countries like China and India. And it is sad that uh, up to now we seem to be doing almost the opposite, where we are now complaining we are being flooded by Indian and Chinese goods. They should not be able to do that if we produce more efficiently. Simple. Uh -huh. We should, in fact, be doing the opposite. We should be the ones flooding with all that we can produce. <laughs> they still constitute a small minority of their own demand. Uh -huh. So that gives us a lot of latitude to use more efficient methods to produce whatever we are producing from primary to secondary and even services sectors like we are seeing we are doing in the film industry, in other uh, uh, heavy manpower propelled uh, IT and so on and so forth. We, we are doing well in some of those sectors. So the sum total is that yes, we should ask for foreign investors, but should take every care to make our own environment in a very sustainable way, more attractive for those funds that will flow from overseas mm -hmm. into our power sector, into our transport sector, and so on and so forth. We should be building fast, wide gauge trains all over the country, not just in a small section of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I served as transport minister. That was the essence of our mass transit program, to build railways, wide gauge, all the way from, say, Lagos to Calabar. And the same thing from Lagos all the way to the old Borneo extension 
to Zambesa forest or whatever you call it, where all these people hide to kidnap our pupils here and there. Mm. This, we should have opened up the economy through investment in infrastructures. And when you are doing this, the question of you are overburdened doesn't arise because people can see the, mm. the level of investment that will be required to open up all these places that will now be the vehicle for paying over the medium and long term debts mm. that you can demand even at our level of uh, indebtedness mm. it is the object of that new investment that will be the thing that will propel investors from uh, coming to your assistance mm. of course in consonance with our own domestic savings and so on and so forth which raises the question of the debt burden that Nigeria has. Um, the most recent report says that our total debt may be up to 118.37 trillion in the next three years, um, based on you know some of the issues that are arising. I, I hope you can hear me, Dr. Kalu. So uh, what we understand is that according to data, Nigeria's government plans to borrow 7.81 trillion naira in 2024 slightly less than uh, you know they targeted 8.84 for the same year uh, previously and we plan to to uh, service the debt with 29.92 trillion naira in three years so what are your thoughts about our borrowing our debt burden in a way that may or may not hinder the economy from growing Well, I especially addressed this, address this question in my last answer. Uh, what I said in sum is that um, despite what may seem to be nominally a high rate of indebtedness, whether in relation to government revenues or in relation to our export earnings or in relation to our gross domestic product, for incremental borrowing, if you are able to show that you have the administrative structure and the discipline to parry your costs against your returns. We are, we are not overborrowed. As I just said, you can see areas where for an economy with our endowment, we need to make sizable investment in Naira and in foreign exchange. Of course, agriculture is one of them, uh, power, uh, railroads, and other forms of transportation, certainly the oil and gas. And there are other key areas in the whole matrix uh, where anybody who is going to lend money, who is weighing the cost of lending and the returns to their lending. Uh -huh. So we can take our eyes away from the quantum size of the nominal debt burden in relation to the indicators I already and focus on all those areas that will create jobs, that will create production in the medium and long term, uh -huh. you can go out, you go out to the multilateral lenders that will give you a sizable grace period, uh, lower interest rates, and overall a low grant element. Element in your total borrowing, we suggest that you have borrowed well that is in terms of the interest payments and the repayment period amortization in relation to the returns that you are going to be getting to cover the cost of borrowing and also create reinvestable surplus that you can now reinvest in the medium and long term. So this is where we are. It requires a, a very empirical analysis of the situation. Uh, we are not in a, a plus or minus or no or yes blunt quick answers. No. It requires a thorough study of the whole financial system, of the potential for expanding uh, areas that have implicit high growth in them. And you can, for Nigeria, it's just about every sector, every sector. So rather than focus so much on the body, we should focus on reducing the waste, reducing the, the endemic corruption. I think we should be able to call it, call it ourselves. So this is the language they want to hear, that we, we can come out clean and acknowledge some of these sh uh, shortcomings. So when you now say, see, we know where we are, we know where we need to go, we have X funds, we need Y funds, so we need to bridge the gap between X and Y. So we need short-term funds for our operators, 
we need a longer time for our producers and so on and so forth. We, we marshal the plan to suggest the various terms of new borrowing that we need to do. This is a thing that will push them and just overlook whether your borrowing is up to 20% of GDP or 50% of your export earnings or 90% of your current uh, revenues. Uh, the emphasis on putting more on capital as opposed to exhaustive consumption, these are the ratios that we have to watch. And then we, we are in a position, given our, given our very uh, broad and robust resource endowment in manpower, land, and resources. Yes, absolutely, yes, that's what I've said. The president Those has said it needs to go said. down. Those are the things that will have positive impact, not just borrowing. The worst thing you want to decide is just to borrowing in the abstract. And the notion of uh, talking about how people will share the money. That is anathema. If you can't be saying certain things and expect somebody to come and give you their money, when the impression is that the borrower is so foolish as to give you money and you just share it out and you don't perform. Mm. That is why you have a membership of uh, the multilaterals, the IMF, the World Bank, the ADB, and other bilaterals who pay as much attention as to what you do and how you expand it over your implementation, disbursements, schedule they don't just give you the money and say we are going to come and uh, 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 recoup our funds without watching how you are putting the money well, so a lot of these things are unduly exaggerated in the public discourse well clearly some very key areas and issues and points that you have raised so we, we do appreciate your perspective this morning dr carlo idiga carlo always a pleasure to have you on thank you very much all right, so let's take a look at some messages coming through from you. Prof. Professor Enahena sends this one about, um, I think it's the economy or um, some policies too. He says the uh, agonizing policies, he's not ha exactly happy with it. He thinks that the policies are incomprehensible and that the tactics is pushing Nigerians into economic abyss. He thinks Nigerians are becoming poorer by the minute goes on over 20 million nigerians you know in the poverty bracket he thinks something should be done about this that's uh, from professor enaina uh, tends to be going in the way of gwr this morning lady justice is blindfolded has a scale in her hand for both sides to put their matter and balance the scale out lady justice does not have an eraser in her hand are we about to set a new record by adding an eraser in her hand? True justice must reign. Ofesto says there is no doubt that the mistake in canal judgment CTC has made the judgment difficult to interpret and any of the parties can allege manipulation. Clerical mistakes in judgment happens anywhere in the world. The Court of Appeal must be allowed to correct it. So... There you go. That's um, the show today. Thank you all for your time and for letting us be a part of your day today. We'll see you next time. I'm Chamberlain, so goodbye. And I'm Ayo Makine. Have a wonderful and productive day.